Watch this. Everyone deals with loss differently. Some do it alone, while others look to heal through a shared experience. A large reminder of the latter has landed in Meridian for those to remember those we lost in a war a half a century ago. If you live by the Boise Airport, then you likely can see, hear, and sometimes feel the roar of a jet engine. It's a concern which has come back around now that Gowan Field could soon see F-16s taking off on a regular basis. We're going to give you some news from today and maybe some from a century ago. Pulling some stories from the Idaho County Free Press, which wasn't exactly free. Since 1982, you've been able to visit a nearly 500 foot long black granite wall. Well, it's actually two walls put together. And they've been engraved with the names of more than 58,000 American servicemen who either died or went missing while fighting in Vietnam. You could see that if you could get to Washington, D.C. Since 1984, a replica of Vietnam Memorial Wall has been traveling the country, bringing the powerful monument to the people. But today, there are two of those replica walls traveling the country, and one of them, the Wall of Healing, arrived in the Treasure Valley yesterday. Hundreds of volunteers and veterans helped put the traveling wall together this morning. And even though the replica is only three-fourths the size, the size of the real thing, it still holds all the names and carries all the emotion for those who were there. Here's Andrew Bartline. It's typically a tool to divide. All right, guys, here's the deal. But for four decades... From here on out, it's now the wall. One barrier's been proven to mend. We're going to carry these panels as if you're carrying their casket. Volunteers carry a collection of memories, a collection of stories, a collection of the names. 58,281. Tim Tates travels for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. I like it. And he's in charge. I like it every week I like it from city to city. Good job, guys. Great work. It's his work to share the wall that heals. You're one of 34 communities to get to host it this year. All for the people who need healing. And I felt if, if you can't uh, go to the wall, we need to bring the wall here. And it's open all week. Out of Danby, Vermont. 24 hours a day. Harvey Howard. But some? So childhood friend. Just couldn't wait childhood another friend. second. Yeah, he graduated a year before I did. So he wasn't even barely a year out of school by the time he was killed in Vietnam. This is Hugo, and he's never been to D.C. to see the real monument. Thanks for staying today. All your help. I'm so that's what we're here for. All right. Thanks. Take your time with him. Hugo stood in this exact spot for six minutes, healing through a wall. It is a, a very powerful emotional experience. Ben McDonald started the push to bring the traveling replica to the Treasure Valley because this is personal to him too. I distinctly remember my recruiter saying, you won't go to Vietnam, you'll go to Germany with the job that you have. Six months later, I was in Vietnam. <laughs> the Memorial Fund normally asks for 40 volunteers. The Treasure Valley provided more than 200 in total. And I thought it was a good thing for me to do. Because vets like Chad Rohr. Yes, I was in the Navy for 21 years. They've always been the volunteer type. Uh, actually, my stepfather was in the Vietnam War, and that just kind of kick-started it all off and uh, inspired me to join when it was my time to go. Long after retirement, it's still their time. You guys still want to do this? You didn't run away yet? Nope. Though their service looks a little different now. Walking side by side is usually the best way to do it. It's their time to make time to heal. 50 years later. So this is super impactful. So Hugo can get six minutes back with his best friend. That then sends it to another generation, grandkids and everything else, and that person's story lives on and their heroism and their sacrifice will make it to a new generation. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund will have someone stationed there 24 hours a day through Sunday at 2 p.m. when they do pack up, go to the next town. And those people there who are on site will help you find a specific name, anything else you have questions about, other items on display too. Most notably, they are holding two events this week. That includes an opening ceremony tomorrow at 9 a.m., though anyone can go see it now regardless, in a candlelight vigil. That's Friday at 9.30 p.m., Brian. 
and that's when they're going to read off all the names of the 200 Idahoans, hmm. who, or more than 200 right. Idahoans, I should say, who have their names on that wall. That, that last shot of your story, seeing that gentleman stand in front of it and how, wall, how, how tall that wall is in front of him. And it's three-fourths of what, what the actual monument is. I've, I've been fortunate enough to see the actual wall, but seeing that come in there and seeing those plates that they are carrying, taking two people to do that, it's a replica, but it's pretty significant in its size by itself. Yeah, and it was significant in the emotions of it, too. There were a couple people that, you know, raised their hands and said, you know, my, my brother is on this. Can I carry his panel? Wow. And they're like, absolutely. And, you know, some people aren't exactly comfortable talking about that, didn't right. want to make them uncomfortable, but you could see the emotion in their eyes of getting to carry the panel with their brother, their stepfather. It meant a lot to those people. 24 hours a day for the next five days, people can visit that? You can go there at 2 a.m. You can say, I got this name. I want to find it on the wall. They'll have someone there to point you in the right direction. Amazing. That'll be even stellar at night. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. The Idaho Air National Guard has been flying fighters out of Gowan Field for over 70 years. The idea of those coming in the most populated city in Idaho doesn't thrill me when they live on the flight path. Remember that highly debated plan to bring F-35A fighter jets to Boise's Gowan Field? Nearby resident Tom Campbell there, the last one you heard speaking. Well, he was speaking a lot for a lot of his neighbors when he was worried about the noise and the disruption they would bring to those who live near the airport. Did that story back in 2019, but less than a year later, after that story, Gowan Field was left off, off the list of future locations for the F-35 squadron. But that worry and debate has resurfaced this time with the possibility of the 124th fighter wing transitioning to F-16s. Are the issues the same as they were four years ago? Joe Paris found out. A short news item from the United States Air Force will soon create big debate, debate that may sound familiar. This week, the Air Force published this headline, Gowan Field Air National Guard Base to transition to F-16 mission. The release sums up the headline saying the 124th Fighter Wing at Gowan Field Air National Guard Base in Idaho is expected to transition to an F-16 Fighting Falcon mission. Now, Air Force says F-16s are expected to begin arriving in spring 2027 after the completion of an environmental impact analysis, which is expected to be completed in spring 25. I heard about it yesterday from somebody that was at a city council meeting. Idaho lawmaker John Gannon is a Boise resident. He was up front and center during the years of debate about bringing F-35s to Gowan Field. He now has similar concerns about the F-16s. Well, I think we're going to have to be real uh, careful as to how it fits in. If the F-16s come, that's going to raise the, it's going to raise the decibel level. We don't know how much, but it's going to raise it, and it is, it's going to impact uh, those who live uh, in really affordable housing. Gannon fully acknowledges things are very early in the process. Still, he echoes consequences from a 2015 Boise report that studied the topic and a 2019 environmental impact statement. I'm very concerned that um, that we evaluate this very carefully so that we're not um, losing uh, very valuable housing. We would have lost 300 homes if the F-35s had come in. And that's, that's in their own report. That's the $400,000 city report. And so uh, we need to be real careful. Gannon points to Burlington, Vermont, as a spot that has seen issues with homes near a loud airfield that hosted F-16s and later F-35s. Burlington, Vermont is a mess uh, where they've lost uh, at least 100 homes that taxpayers have bought because of the noise from the airport that occurred with F-16s. Now they have F-35s and really, it's really been very divisive for the entire community. I reached out to the city of Boise for their thoughts on the project. They say in a statement, quote, the city wasn't made aware of the potential of the F-16 until we saw it in the news. We look forward to hearing more from the Air Force on the transition plan, the impact the planes will have on our neighborhoods and their plans to engage the community. Again, these are very early on in the process. An environmental impact study will be done by spring 2025, and that report will provide major data on decibels and the environment. Still, Ganning suggests another idea location for the mission. We do have Mountain Home Air Force Base only 30 minutes away. Uh, Burlington, M Vermont has no other Air Force Base in the entire state. <laughs> so, but uh, we, you know, we have an Air Force Base 30 miles away that's one of the best bases in the country. And so that, that's always there as an option, it would seem. 
And I just spoke with the Idaho Air National Guard over the phone a very short time ago, and they tell me, yes, this is the plan to have these F-16s that come out to the Boise area to Gowan Field. Idaho National Guard tells me again over the phone that they are very excited for the mission, and uh, they have a lot of experience with fighter planes and fighter pilots. And Brian, they say that, you know, this is something that they're excited to see here at Gowan, but um, over the next month or so is when the National Guard is going to get more of a timeline in terms of, okay, this is when this study will happen. This is when we expect to roll that out. So uh, this was just announced this week by uh, the Secretary of the Air Force. So it, it is very new to a lot of people who might have not heard about it until today. Uh, but there will be a lot of environmental impact studies that will have to go into this, similar to the F-35. I'd be interested to know what the difference would be between the A-10s that fly out of there now. Twice a day, back in 2019, we did that story. They were flying, what, 18 of these uh, planes at twice a day. What the difference would be? And I know we're still waiting on that environmental study, but... If they're flying out of there twice a day now with A-10s, how much is going to change with the F-16s flying out of there twice a day? Yeah, and based on some of the research I was able to do today, and the problem is that F-16s, there's a lot of different versions of them. Some can be louder than others. F-16s have been allowed, around for a long time, so you would imagine that the newer ones have different capabilities. But long story short, it would appear that the F-16, it is quieter than the F-35. Mm -hmm. The question is, how much louder, or what is the difference between the F-16 and the A-10? All right, we'll wait on that. All right, thank you very much, Joe. How about a 4th of July celebration described as sufficient? That sounds fun, but it also sounds like we're revisiting headlines and notices from Idaho's past. What's happening in Grangeville a hundred years ago? But right now, we'd like to hear from you. All you have to do is send us a text message. Include your name and the hashtag the 208 and send it to the number on your screen. 208-321-5614. Keep it sharp and short and we'll probably share it at the end of the show. So stick around. If you've been with us for any amount of time here on the 2-8, you like to, you know, you know we like to give you some in-depth look at whatever's happening recently in the news. But we also like to sprinkle in some cool features, things like uh, history, some stuff about people in history. What about a historical story on the actual news, you know, like what was going on 100 years ago today in Idaho County? For the price of $1.50 a year. You can grab yourself a crisp new edition of the Idaho Country Free Press for Grangeville, Idaho, Thursday, June 28th, 1923. Let's start from the beginning. Yes, the very beginning. The Pioneers and Legion had 4th of July celebration. Must be the bee's knees because it beat out the title of the paper. So what's big time for all who visit Grangeville for this? Well, be prepared. While it is not planned to make the celebration a gigantic affair, the program will be sufficient with some great fireworks, followed by old time pioneer ball, which is really a picnic, where AJ Parker says, bring your basket dinners and have a good time, for life is short and all hands are entitled to all the enjoyment we can get after the hard times. Thanks, AJ. How about some more life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? They included a nice picture of the Statue of Liberty, you know, the one in New York City, because freedom. 
And Carl Burquist climbed to the top of the Lady Liberty crown. There's a new map of Idaho County that only free press subscribers can have. Flash! U.S. Senator William E. Bora announced he will not be a presidential candidate or lead a third party, all while he was sitting in a barber chair. Someone moved to West Point. Someone moved the Forest Service. Someone moved the Grangeville and Kuski basketball game. And a deposed schoolmaster is suing the Woodland District for $500, all because of a school fight which is declared to have divided the community into bitterly contending factions. How scandalous! We'll leave you with John B. Useless getting ready to shave. Shaving, shaving, shaving some more. And ow! Off to the barber shop for John. Ha 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 ha! And that's the news, June 28th, 1923. I guess it's about time we start considering cartoons for the 208, unless you consider what we just did a cartoon. This is your daily in-show reminder. We rely on your responses to what we do by email or by text message. 208-321-5614. Hashtag the 208. By the way, that's also the number to leave us a voicemail. Remember those? Share your comments and your complaints, but do try to keep them clean. That way we can share them with everyone else. Those are some amazing photos from Sunday's storms, I believe, over towards Mountain Home, which is incredible photos. Thanks for posting those on our Idaho Weather Watchers page. We love seeing the photos that you all post there. We have more storms today. I haven't seen any dramatic photos like that. Today's storm activity has been much more scattered and widespread, not as well organized as all of that. But still, we've had some rumbles of thunder heard in Boise, not from a storm in Boise, but nearby. And it looks pretty gray out there over the Boise Mountains right now. 79 degrees in the city of trees. 
degrees. We have cooled a touch since hitting our high of 81 earlier this afternoon. McCall's observed high so far for today is 64. Look where McCall is right now at 54 degrees. So storm cooled air having a pretty big impact on temperatures. Haley, for instance, is still in the 70s. Jerome and Twin Falls has been a beautiful day for you in the Magic Valley up near 80 degrees. So you can see Magic Valley, a couple little sprinkles rolling through, not a whole lot there. We've had a couple sprinkles trying to develop across northern Ada County, but most of the action today has really been across our central mountain locations. Look how interesting this is. You can see these storms moving from south to north. These storms, as you head just a little bit west, moving from north to south. And that's because we have this big counterclockwise rotation around this exiting area of low pressure. So we're kind of right in the middle of it here. So you get the kind of the rotation that comes up here. The air circulates around and comes back around this way. So it's kind of an interesting rotation of those storms. So depending on where you are will really uh, depend on where you see those storms coming from and heading to. But big picture the story here is that today is likely our last active weather day until we see this heat start intensifying. So no more storms in the forecast, but we have sizzling temperatures coming in for the final day of June and into early July. Tomorrow's kind of our transition day. We'll see those high temperatures jumping up to the upper 80s and low 90s here in the Treasure Valley and well into the 70s across the mountains. And then speaking of the mountains, if you're looking to head to the hills to maybe beat the heat that is setting in for the Treasure Valley, it'll be beautiful but abnormal normally warm up in the mountains for over the weekend and into the 4th of July holiday with low to mid 80s on tap. And here's that seven day forecast for the city of trees. So up near 90 tomorrow, well into the 90s on Friday. That will be our hottest day of 2023 so far, but we don't stop there almost at the triple digits on Saturday. I'm not going there yet. I think we'll hit 99. Some models hinting at 100 for Boise on Saturday, no matter which way you slice it. That is hot 98 for Sunday and we stay dry, sunny and very warm all the way through the middle of next week. Just in time for those hot temperatures, opening of the Boise River to floating, and it's about the only thing dropping faster than Airbnb stock these days. Finally, float season is officially here. Well, tomorrow, actually. Not today, tomorrow it will be. Looking at the levels on the river right now, not, not like what they were a month ago. Obviously, things have dropped significantly. Boise Parks and Rec says the river has dropped enough safely to open the six mile stretch from Barber Park to Ann Morrison Park. You're looking at the Whitewater Park there. This is video of people pushing off from Barber Park to enjoy that float. Take you about two hours or so, depending on how fast you paddle. But the river flowing right now uh, is right around 1,000 CFS, just about a little bit above that. Boise Fire is currently wrapping up its initial cleanup of the major hazards that they find along the Boise River and along that stretch. Rentals and other services will also open for the season tomorrow, which includes the shuttle. It'll take you from Ann Morrison to Barber Park and back and forth. So grab a tube, just not a dollar store one because those don't last so well. And good luck cooling off in the Boise River. power of Shoshone Falls on the Snake River is a sight and sound to behold this spring. Its massive waters impress even locals who have visited the attraction for years. Okay, so Shoshone Falls isn't flowing like that these days. That was way back in May 3rd, 1997, during an episode of Exploring Idaho, when Shoshone Falls was running about 30,000 cubic feet per second. Nine times more than the measly 3,000, uh, I should say about almost 10 times more, more than 10 times more than what we're seeing right now. Just over 3,000 CFS is still what we're doing in, in the Shoshone Falls area and over the falls, but still about, I guess, what, three times faster than what we're seeing on the Boise River. So the water's flowing, but they're going to add some more fun to what's coming over the falls because they're going to add lights to it like they have for the last few years. A fan favorite is coming back. Shoshone Falls Dark starts after dark, that is. Shoshone Falls after dark is going to start up again July 5th. It's going to run through the night, so a short window to see it. But they do have a second weekend for the 12th through the 16th. So two opportunities for you to get out there and check it out. Get this, it's really going to light up because of the increased flows on the falls. It, more lights have been added this year. The show goes until 1030 at night. Get your tickets fast because they do sell out. You can't just show up. They do have limited space, and we have more details right now at KTVB.com. Falls to festivals now. Not sure if sandals or boots would be more appropriate for this one. God and Country Festival back tonight at the Ford Idaho Center in Nampa. A door's going to open at 6.30. Performances from Honey Deaton and Dreamgrass with her red-headed bluegrass revival road quartet. 
and refresh workshop. That's all happening tonight. Plus, the city of Napa is going to end it all off with a fireworks right at the end of the festival. A lot of comments on the F-16s possibly coming to Gowan Field in the next couple of years. A lot of them like this one. F-16s, the sound of freedom. Got a lot of those comments today. Love the Jets at Gowan. Bring them on, says Mike in Boise. But then on the other side, well, this is more, I guess, kind of sensical or farcical. I want to complain because when I bought my house that was in the approach of the Boise Airport, I didn't think about the noise, says Dave. Yeah, I get it. That's what's happening, I'm sure. I worked out at Gowan and we had F-4 aircraft, which were even louder than F-16s, and people complained about the noise then when they moved in. People who live near an airport should expect noise, says Brian in Star. Meanwhile, be sure to come out to Gowan Thunder in August, so if you want to know what they sound like, they're going to have some F-16s then. That's coming up in August. You can hear them up close, says Steve. Good reminder. Thank you. We were fortunate enough to visit Washington, D.C. and visit the Vietnam Memorial. It was a very moving experience for both of us, especially when I found the name of a fellow shipmate. So happy the memorial has been brought here to Boise as a tribute and a memory of all those who made the ultimate sacrifice, says Carl in Star. Get out and see it over in Sensi and Meridian. We'll see you tomorrow.